Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Just want to take a brief moment and say that I know that there is a lot of heavy burdens in this room today. I know that many of you carry a lot of burdens with you. I know that many of us are searching for answers and in hopes that we can find peace, maybe some answers. And I'm here to tell you, the Lord understands. Amen. He has not forgotten His children. Can I get an amen? amen? I want you to turn to the person on your left and tell them, I am glad you are here. If you'll notice, you're talking to the back of their head. I should have thought that one through. We'll try that next week. I'm excited about this morning's sermon, and the reason why I have the lights down is not only to create the mood of holiness, amen, <laughs> but so that we can kind of see these pictures because I know that many of us in this room, we're, we're visual people, and a lot of times in our life when, when we get a lot of burdens put upon us or a lot of circumstances put upon us that we forget just to see what is in front of us. And that is the evidence that God cares for you. Can I have an amen? amen? I know right now that as of yesterday, the reason why Jordan was not here this morning is he is now a husband. Uh, I don't know how it happened. He was so young. <laughs> but not only that, uh, Pastor Allen and Tana's daughter Tamara got married yesterday Yay! as well. Woo! Both were beautiful weddings, but I will tell you this. Pastor Allen is really emotional today and needs our love. So today, after this service, when you see Pastor Allen, if you would just embrace him. Let him know that you love him. Now listen to me. He may tell you, get off me. But the truth is, he wants you to hold him longer, okay? So make sure you do that. Today, we're going to talk about God as a consuming fire. If you live in West Texas and, and you understand why we have firework bands in the month of July, you understand how consuming a fire can be. West Texas, a fire can light in, in a field and it can spread very quickly and consumes everything in it. If you are from New Mexico in the Rio Dosa area, you have a prime example in front of you of how massive a fire can consume matter. It can just consume <coughs> everything. And our God is a consuming fire. But sometimes when we hear that, we really don't understand what that means. A lot of us will associate fire with destruction, and I'll tell you, there's a part of that in the consuming fire of God. There are some things within us that need to be destroyed. Can I get an amen? amen. We're going to look at some scriptures today, and here's the scriptures we're going to look over. And the reason why I'm putting them up here is because it is important for us to be in the habit of of reading scripture throughout the week. Can I get an amen? amen? I know some of us are like, wait a second, scripture is for Sunday. And sometimes Wednesday if you're holy enough. <laughs> That's where I put in the plug of Wednesday nights from 7 to 8 o'clock. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> We're going to be in Exodus at the beginning, and we have covered Exodus 3, 1 through 8 last week, but we're going to look at it through a different perspective. And then we're going to continue to go down to Exodus, and that <laughs> book of the Bible was within the Old Testament, and then we'll get into the New Testament, and get into Hebrews and Acts, and hopefully we'll be able to understand all about the fire of God, this consuming fire. So let's take a look at the first example in Exodus 3, chapter 1 through 8. This is the story of Moses and the burning bush. We read this last week, but I know that we need to read it again, Amen. Amen. 
Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Herod, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight while the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. God said, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I will read that part again for those of us who have a heavy burden this morning. God says, I have seen the misery of my people. Do you believe that today? There's something valuable that when we are hurting, to know that we are not alone. Even if you don't believe in God, I promise you, you are experiencing His presence when you are in trials and tribulation. Because He's always there. Do we believe this? Say amen. amen. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. From this scripture, we can learn basically three parts of this burning bush. And really think about that. How would you react if you went and saw one bush burning and it was not being consumed? It would be kind of unusual. <coughs> I remember when I was a youth pastor, I had a camp where a bunch of my youth were staying the night in tents. And if you've ever been on a, as an adult, been on a camp with teenagers in a tent, sometimes it's really trying. <laughs> it's hot. It's sticky. This hurts. My bed's flat. Pastor, help me. I'm hungry. Where's the snacks? And you want to choke them and say, we're here for Jesus. <laughs> There's a cliff over there and you're going to walk it if you don't settle down. <laughs> and I remember there was this moment where I said, I want to give them something they'll remember. And we had covered this scripture on the Wednesday of the previous week. So on that Saturday night at 3 o'clock in the morning, I decided let us create an experience they will not forget. Oh. Amen. Amen. <laughs> So I went to my interns and I said, go get me a bush and set it out in the middle of the dirt road. <laughs> Catch it on fire. We will give them this experience. They came back and said, Pastor, we have found the bush, but we cannot light it. It will not be consumed by the fire. And I said, that's why the Lord gave us lighter fluid. <laughs> So we douse this bush and we catch it on fire and we wake all the kids up. They just went to bed about 2 o'clock. We wake them up at 3 o'clock. We have them walk down the road and behold, there's a bush. And I give a 15-minute speech on how beautiful this experience was. And, and I'm looking at the kids and it seems like they're all into it because they're doing this. <laughs> That next morning, we got up about 10 o'clock and we got around the campfire and I say, who would like to comment on the experience last night? One of them said, what experience? <laughs> the one with the burning bush. There's a fire? Really? And over half of them couldn't even remember it. Maybe I should have thought that one through too. <laughs> But what we learn is that in this moment, 
there was something unusual happening. Moses saw this fire and this light in this bush that wasn't being burned. He found that curious. And like many of us curious people, when we hear a noise outside, we grab our flashlight and our sandals and we go to see what it is. And then when we see that it's a bear, we thought, I should have grabbed the gun. <laughs> He's curious and he goes to look at this and from this he hears Moses. Moses, and, and he calls back out. And from that point, God reveals his identity to Moses. He says, this is who I am. I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, he was declaring, especially when he told him, take your shoes off. You're in my presence, which means this is holy ground. Can I get an amen? Amen. So there Moses hid his face. God revealed to him who he was. And here's the part that I really love. He begins to reveal to Moses through this burning bush that he is concerned for the suffering of his people. Now I don't know about you guys, but there's been many of those prayers that I have given to God to fix the problem that I created. No amens on that one? <laughs> Not anybody else here? Nobody else has been about to go into the courtroom and say, Lord, may that ticket just disappear in your power. <laughs> now we're laughing. <laughs> he showed that he cared. He showed that I know when my kids hurt. Let me say that again. God knows when his children hurt. Even though you may think nobody else sees it, you might have a smile on your face but be dying inside. You may want to share your pain, but you don't want to be a burden to somebody else. I'm here to tell you God knows and understands your suffering. Please give me an amen. amen. The next story in Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 22. This is when the Lord, after hearing the suffering of His people, sent Moses back to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, out of their slavery, out of their pre-existing life. He's going to free them from their troubles. Let's see what happens. Exodus 13, 17-22 says this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. I want to stop right there. The Lord said, I'm not going to give them the short and easy way out. Because sometimes when they face war, they run right back to where they came from. Let that sink in. Let it sink in. I know in my life there's been times I said, Lord, you must deliver me. I am struggling and I need help. And he begins to deliver me. And I'm walking it out. But as soon as I get resistance to what God is doing, I go right back to who I used to be. That is very tragic because the Lord has provided a way out. I just become a baby and say it's too difficult. I'm going to go back to what is normal. And get back into my suffering. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, hear these words today. The Lord has delivered you from your suffering, yet you must follow Him. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Verse 18, so God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He said, God will surely come to your aid. God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud. In other words, a pillar of smoke to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Here's another example of the fire of God. So that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud 
or smoke by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, left its place in front of the people. I would think I was a part of something pretty special if everywhere I go, a cloud of smoke went before me. Think about an awesome entrance. Some of us in this room like to be, quote, fashionably late. That's an excuse for us because we're not very good with the concept of time. Give me an amen. amen. But imagine if everywhere you showed up, smoke came through first during the day. And then you entered in. I mean, you need your own theme music for that. That's awesome. And everywhere they went during the day, the pillar of smoke led them. And by night when it was dark, when they were surrounded by darkness, a pillar of fire continued to go before them. Here's what we can learn from this story in the fire of God. That the Lord led the way. The people did not get in front of the column of smoke or fire. But they followed it. Notice this, ladies and gentlemen. They didn't have to know what the final destination was. Can I have an amen? amen. Understand that today. You don't have to know the end result. All you need to know is, are you following God? God is an incredible navigator. He knows what is before you and He knows what is behind you. And our requirement is to follow Him. The next thing we can learn is that He lit their path. He was the light for them in the midst of darkness. They didn't try to find any other way of navigation. They couldn't. The only thing they could do was follow the light that was in front of them. How many times in our life do we try to look for other avenues of light instead of the light which can only show us His truth? It's so funny how we can quickly replace God with something that we think favors us better. Do you want to know what your good friends are? Good friends are the people that hear your problems and agree with you. Can I have an amen? <laughs> you know who your best friends are? Your best friends are the ones who hear your problem and call you on your junk. Amen. They don't agree with you to get out of the situation. They tell you what you must change because more than likely they care about you enough that they want you to be a better person. Amen. He lit their path. The next story in Exodus, and this is the one where we find that the fire of God settles. And in this scripture, we're going to find out how big God is and how little we are. There's only three or four amens on that one. Amen. Hey, we're Texans, Dad Gummit. We're the only state big enough for God to fit in. And I know God carries a pistol and is a Republican. Give me an amen. amen. <laughs> Everybody hold your NRA card up. Here we go. No. No, really don't. We'll be the only church in town that praises the Lord by shooting pistols in the air. <laughs> Know this, God does not need our existence to exist. He is, He has always been, and it's so funny when we act like we know better than Him. As if we were there at the beginning of time. I heard a pastor say this, there is no birth certificate for God. He was created way before us. However, sometime in our life, it was for me when I turned 21 that I thought I knew best for my life. Anybody else in this room? How did that work out for us? Let's just leave it there. This is when the Lord stops and He settles on a mountain. Exodus 19, 10 through 19 says this, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not approach the mountain 
or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. But keep in mind, don't touch the foot of it. That's important. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Now, let me go ahead and give you the understanding of what this thunder and lightning look like. Don't think of it as those thunderstorms that roll by here. And if you're like me, you like to open up the window so you can be lullabied by the sounds of the rolling thunder. <laughs> oh, that's nice. No, it's that one that you see the lightning real quick, and then you pause, and all of a sudden, boom! And your kid's running to your bed. <laughs> You get no sleep because you have five people in your bed. <laughs> this was serious business. And the lightning was ongoing and the thunder continued to crash. Verse 18. I'm sorry, verse 16. With a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. There's the other example of the fire of God. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. We can learn from this. First of all, this is a harsh truth, but it is the truth, and we want the truth. Give me an amen. amen. Nothing impure can survive in the presence of God. Amen. And it is funny in our culture how we think we can be righteous and sinful at the same time. Now just follow me here. In this day and age, with Moses and the people, you could not be in the presence of God and have sin in your life or you would drop dead. That's why they said don't touch the foot of the mountain because the Lord is present. And if you're unclean and you touch that, you're to be stoned or shot with arrows, but don't touch them because you might be killed too. Imagine that picture. Because you know there was that one guy. <laughs> the one guy that always pushed the envelope. The one that you tell, don't touch that thing because it's hot. And they go, this? Psst, ah. You know he's sitting at the foot of that mountain. Will it really happen? And all of a sudden, he touches it. There's an arrow. Darn it. <laughs> he might have said some other things in different languages that are not appropriate for this church. <laughs> in the presence of God, nothing impure can exist. And here's another harsh truth. In this time, the presence of God brought fear and trembling. Oh, how many times in the Old Testament... Did God send an angel to show himself before somebody? And almost every angel in Scripture had to say these words, Do not be afraid. Because the truth is, as much as we like to think we're pretty secure in who we are and seeing amazing things, to see an angel of God would make every strong man in this room go, Oh my gosh. <laughs> I am so freaking out right now. <laughs> you'd panic because you'd see something that you don't understand. 
And that's not even the presence of God. That's the presence of an angel. In Daniel, it said when the angel showed up, Daniel began to be very weak in terror. And he fell to the ground and he began to ask for death because he was afraid. And the angel said, be strong. And he touched Daniel, and the Lord filled him with strength just so he could stand up and face the angel. And Daniel begins to praise the angel. The angel said, do not praise me. Praise God who sent me. Amen. So we have to understand that in this time, God was all power. And we could not exist in his presence without the presentation of death. So no wonder... There's fear and trembling when you come before God. But now let's go and see what happens with this fire of God after Christ has died on the cross. You see, Jesus came because we could not touch that mountain. We could not exist with God. He died on the cross so that His blood could cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That there would be no name above His name so that we could be in the presence of God. Give me an amen if you understand that. Because it is going to make this next scripture very powerful. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 18 through 29 says this. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm. The writer of Hebrews is referring to the story in Exodus. To a trumpet blast or to such a, vi a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. We remember this from Exodus. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not accept when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time the voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is, created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Now, I know that was a long scripture and you may have a lot of questions. Let me give you the breakdown of it. He is referring to that moment back with Moses when we weren't even able to approach the mountain. But because of Jesus Christ, it's not about us being approaching a mountain. We are on the mountain. We are in the presence of not only God on the mountain, but we are on His mountain with His angels in view of His presence because Jesus Christ has approved us through His sacrificial blood. Guys, if you just wrap your mind around this, there was a time where they could not exist in the presence of God, but because of Jesus Christ, we get to be in the presence of God. You know what really is sad? Is the fact that He desires for us to be in His presence, but we are too focused on our circumstances to realize that we have the power of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Man, if we understand that, then we can understand James when he says, count it all joy when you go through trials and tribulations. Because they will not be the end of you. There are times in our lives where we think this is it. I cannot survive this, yet you are here. The Lord has seen you through. And He will continue to be faithful to see you through. Once again, we are not a people located at the foot of the mountain. We are on it. And notice this, that it said in the last that He'll be able to shake heaven and earth. 
And everything that is unable to stand will fall so that the only thing that remains are those things that are unshakable. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're in Christ Jesus, you are unshakable. Now let's really be honest with ourselves and discuss how we operate whenever we are influenced by circumstances. Some of us shift like the waves in the sea. I'm remembering when I was in junior high trying to ask a girlfriend out. You write the note because you're not going to face her. And you're writing the note and you're spraying polo cologne on it. Maybe I'm dating myself. Some of you are like, yeah, I remember polo. Because we thought that was the ointment that got all the women. After football, don't shower. Douse yourself in polo. They'll come running. This generation, it's Axe Body Spray. No man should put on a body spray, but we can bathe in cologne, ain't it? That's that pain. I would write this letter and spray with cologne, and I would sit there and say, do you like me? <laughs> Circle yes or no. <laughs> and then if you're creative like me and the master of picking up women, you would write an example. Here's an example. You'd put yes or no and then circle yes. <laughs> That's right. Smooth. I know. I know. I, I know many of you women are going, where were you in when I was in junior high? I would send that note, and then from me sending that note, the waiting game begins. And you don't know how to act. And the sad thing that you did is you told your friends that you were sending the note. And so your friends are asking you, did you get it back? Did you get it back? And you're going, you know what? I don't care, you know? I don't care. I don't know, did you hear something? <laughs> she talked, don't tell me, dude, straight up, tell me, did you hear something? You know, never mind, I don't even care. I don't care. Oh my God, I love her so much, man. I don't know what to do, man. I'm kind of freaking out. <laughs> now forget her, man. I didn't meet her, I found another girl, man. We go back and forth, and what's so sad is here we are, adults. And remember what I said earlier, when pressure comes, we result back to the same way we used to be. The enemy laughs when he is able to manipulate us by circumstances. Guys, you have to understand that circumstances always change. If you're in a bad circumstance, it eventually will become good. If you are in good circumstances, more than likely, here's some bad ones coming. Can I get an amen? amen? That is life. And the Lord desires for us not to be shifted back and forth. But no matter what the circumstances are, that we are unshakable. Not in our own power. But because we stand in the presence of God. Last story and we'll be done. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 12 says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cap. Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and post-Texas. <laughs> I added that part, forgive me, I'm not supposed to do that. And the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? 
Oh, now we see a different fire of God. No longer is it the burning bush. No longer is it the pillar of fire. No longer is it fire that has to settle on a mountain. It became God's fire within His people. The fire is within us if we are in Christ Jesus. That should show us by example of the pillar of fire and, and, and the bush of fire and the mountain that if that same fire, because God says I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, that fire of God is within us, then what are we afraid of? Amen. Think about that. You have access to all authority in heaven. Quit listening to the lies of the enemy and begin to declare to that jerk the truth of God. Amen. Stand up and do not be shaken. If Satan begins to tell you about your circumstances, tell him I'm not defined by my circumstances. I'm defined by the power of God. Amen. He hates it when we do that. Then we remind him of this beautiful scripture. If I submit to him, Satan, I can resist you and you have to beat it. Do you want to know what happens spiritually when you do that? See, Satan, he's like a weasel. He likes to come out whispering in your ear, your life's falling apart. You've screwed it up. You can't change. You'll never be the same. Everything's all is lost. The sky is falling. The government's going to kill you. All these things he lies. Maybe not the last one, but at least the one preaching. <laughs> and from that point, we begin to get influenced. Oh my, no, no, hopefully not. When what we should be doing is saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. At that point, in the enemy of Satan, which is the angels of God, show up. And remember how we react? The scriptures, how we reacted to the angels of God showing up? It's twice as bad for Satan to see the presence of an angel of God. So as we sit there and we say, I'm not going to believe the lies. I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. It's as if these angels show up behind you and they look over you and they look at Satan. And they're like, what's up? <laughs> You're not allowed to be here. Satan, Satan says, how come? They say because they're standing on the fire of God and where you are standing is holy ground. And nothing impure can be in the presence of God. Beat it or I'm going to do something. <laughs> Once again, that's a loose translation. <laughs> Thanks in first opinions when we say, don't start nothing, won't be nothing. Can I get an amen? <laughs> All we have to do is stand in that fire and everywhere we go, we are on holy ground. But do not get it twisted. Do not be impure and think that the Lord has blessed your impurity. Amen. Let's be real with ourselves. We have to be a better people. I love how they said, what does this mean? It means simply this. Because of His sacrifice, the fire of God is inside us. If God's fire be in us, then we must become the fire of God to the world. Amen. Think about that. Just like the burning bush to Moses, we are to be something peculiar that people look at and say, what is it about that person? And as they come to us and see us, that they would be able to see who God is. And in that, may they also understand that God and us care for them. Just like the burning bush, we are to be that burning bush to others. Also, when people decide to follow God, may we show them that the fire within us can be the fire within them and that that fire will lead them and be the light on their path. Amen. You see, that's what's beautiful about this. The Lord did not say, I will always be a God that you cannot be a part of. Instead, he sacrificed his own son and said, Be my fire. Light up 
this world. Well, let's talk about being the fire real quick. We got a little bit more time. But you can tell I get passionate about this. And here's the reason why. Because I've seen many people in this room have been beaten up by the world. I've seen many people in this room that love to beat up yourself. And what you do not see is the potential of the precious, sanctified holiness of God that you are becoming. If you would just trust and follow God. Let's be the fire of God. What does that mean? I can tell you what that means. There's an example of this congregation. It happened a couple of Christmases ago, and I didn't, I was not aware of this. Maybe you were, but at this Christmas time, Christmas Eve, there were people in line to get tamales. I had no idea that in West Texas, tamales were a part of the Christmas season. <laughs> Armando's back there going, dude, it is. <laughs> and what happened at this place of tamales, <laughs> there was a long line and it was very cold. And, and this grandmother, a grandmother of means, had gone to this place because she had forgotten to get the traditional tamales for her Christmas lunch. I had no idea. And she shows up to realize that the place is closed and the only way she can get it is through the drive through And the line is so long. And as she's walking back to her car, she said, I will never be able to get tamales. And she was very saddened by it until she heard a voice say, ma'am. <laughs> and she looked over and in this truck was this tatted out guy and his family. Right on. He says, you're looking for tamales? This is her story, by the way. And she's in her meat coat. Beautiful little old lady. And he says, she says, yeah, I am, but I'm probably not going to be able to, to, to get there in time because i got to go. And he says, why don't you get in our truck and wait with us? Amen. And here she goes. <laughs> okay, did I leave my wallet in the car? Okay, good. Uh, the only thing they can take is the meat coat. I better call somebody and let them know where I am. And all of a sudden, his wife scoots over and he opens the passenger side and he's all big. Here you go, man. Get in the car. Get in the car, touch the door, and he goes over there and begins to wait. And I started thinking how funny it would be to the car behind him. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I got you on with that lady. Oh man, something's going down. Get your phone. Call 911. Don't, don't push talk yet. And all of a sudden, like, he's making her get in the car. He's forcing her to go. They're robbing her. They're going to rob her. Hold on. Don't push it yet. And they got in the car, and I bet they see the thing shaking. It's probably because they were laughing. They were having a good time. And, and, and I can imagine that person's going, they're killing her. They're killing her. Call 911. But here's the story from her. He said, I saw it was cold out there. And there was no reason that a beautiful lady like you should be out there in the cold. You need to be in this warm truck and we're going to get you some tamales. Amen. She says, thank you so much. You guys are such a godsend. And the guy goes, we do believe in God, man. We love Jesus and we want to be about his business. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> She says, oh, you guys go to church. I go to First Church of the Nazarene. And they go, we go to church too, but it's kind of a different church. We, we're this a church for people who don't fit into churches. And she says, my, I can't tell you this part because it'll identify and I'm not going to say it. But the point is, she goes, I know somebody at that church. It's a relative of mine. And she says, is the church you go to the refuge? Woo. That person said, yes, ma'am, it is. And they got her tamales, and then they put her in her car, and she went on her way. And she went to Christmas and said, I saw the face of Jesus. Amen. And he had tattoos all over his face. <laughs> that is being the fire of God. And what's funny is it's hilarious when it's not in character. <laughs> if you're a person that goes to work and you're frustrated and you don't want anybody to talk to you, become the encourager of your workplace. Yeah. You'll freak everybody out. <laughs> 
You're the person going to work that's usually in a bad mood, but instead you go in and you go, good morning. <laughs> Can I get you some coffee? What happened to you? The fire is burning within me. And it's a beautiful day. And I got an opportunity to enjoy this day with my God. And I just want to share it with you. Now hear me on this. It's not about getting conversions. I do not think God wants us to go out there and say, you must become a Christian. And at that, you better become Nazarene. <laughs> the only church you better go to is the refuge because that's the only good church. <laughs> it ain't like that. Notice this. I think it's more important not to worry about getting a conversion from somebody, but being the conversion to somebody. I don't want to have to persuade them to God. I want them to see God in me. And I do that by saying, do you need tamales? <laughs> I do that by saying, can I help you carry that? Imagine the look on people's face when the outcasts of the world become the servants of the world. I promise you that fire within you will begin to spread all throughout this city. And the word of God, which is the wind, will blow that fire everywhere. But ladies and gentlemen, we have to realize that we got to make our mind up. Guess what? Tomorrow is Monday. And it was a great day. We get to go to work tomorrow. We get to love on others. People get to make fun of us and do us wrong, and we don't have to react. Can I get an amen? amen. Many people right now are going, I ain't agreeing with that. <laughs> if you want freedom in your life to the point that when your circumstances shift, you don't, the only way to obtain this is by living by the fire of God. Let Him direct you. Let Him shine through you. Be the person that everyone finds disgusting. Be the goofy, you know what, grinning person at work. Good to see you. Nothing is better than watching people dig ditches and praise God. Amen. If there was ever a place, ladies and gentlemen, that I thought God had brought together a people to serve the world, it would be this place. May we find tomorrow as an opportunity to be consumed by the fire of God and to be the fire of God to others. Can I get an amen? amen. Let's stand together. Grab the hand of the person next to you. Yeah, yeah, go both. Let's go both. <laughs> Father, I thank you so much for this morning. Lord, I thank you for your words. Lord, that you will guide us. And Lord, that your fire is a consuming fire. So Father, I pray right now on behalf of this congregation and everyone in this room, Lord, that you would consume us with your love. For Father, that is your fire. Lord, no matter where we go, may we know that as your fire is in us, that we are on holy ground. And Father, though they may beat us, may we retaliate by love. For in that, Father, the world will change. Do all that you have in mind with your people. Be love in our lives. And give us the boldness to love well. In Jesus' name, everyone say Amen. Amen. Thank you and have a great week.